Welcome to Fertility Talks. I'm Mary Wong, founder of Alive Holistic Health Clinic, author of Pathways to Pregnancy, acupuncturist, and your fertility strategist. Tonight, I am so honored to have Dr. Jody Peacock here once again with us. And tonight, we're actually going to talk about the importance of sleep for fertility. And uh, before we go into the depth of this conversation, I just want to tell you who Dr. Peacock is. Um, so she's a naturopathic doctor with a special interest in uh, fertility, as well as women's horm hormonal health. She's a co-founder of the Canadian Fertility Show, which is actually in its third year, and it's happening this weekend on Saturday, and um, more about that later, all right? But because I know you guys are dying to hear about sleep, because people ask us every single day. Is that what happens to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's a really great topic. And the other thing I want to add is that you're the chief medical officer at Enhanced Fertility. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. I know you're really busy and both of us, you know, we had a long day of work and then we come here to do this for you guys for free to give you the correct information uh, with, you know, based on science and research and professional expertise. So here we are. And I guess the very, very first question that everybody would want to know is how many hours should we be getting to sleep? So that's a great starting point for sure. And I think the thing with any of those generalizations is there's no right answer, right? It is individual for each person. Um, the thing I generally will use as a guide for patients is can they wake up in the morning without an alarm clock? Um, and when they wake up, do they feel rested? Can they make it through their day without, you know, using a lot of stimulants? So if you're drinking, you know, five cups of coffee a day to get through your day, but you have good energy, I don't consider that good energy, right? So if you can make it through your day, no problem, and you fall asleep easily, you have good energy, you're probably getting enough sleep. Um, now, good. I don't find very many people fall in that category. <laughs> Yeah. And the diff, I think, you know, I, I love how you answered that. So it's not like specifically, oh, you need eight hours sleep because people will feel really sub, um, self-conscious about that. And it's difficult. Like they'll feel bad about themselves. It's like, oh my gosh, Mary, maybe my fertility is going to be totally bad now because I don't get enough sleep. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they feel bad about themselves. So it's not about that. So I love what you're saying here. And just about listening to your body, engaging, you know, do I have enough energy? Love it. And then the other thing I find also is there's definitely variations through the year. Like oftentimes people can feel more energized in the summer when we have, you know, more light, they want to go to bed earlier in the winter time. And so being okay with that, I think is also really important. Yeah, it's awesome. So here's the, uh, this is like totally an issue here because I'm doing this interview and my father is here getting something for my daughter. So you have to give me one second. Right at the front door, there's a bag. Right at the front door, there's a plastic, brown paper bag. The brown paper bag right there. It's right there. <laughs> that one. Okay, bye, thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, here's the reality of life. So as I said, you know, we are um, committing ourselves to do this for you guys and life happens. And I, I actually want to give you a little minor background. Every time I do this um, fertility talks interview, I line up that my parent who takes my kid to their home and she sleeps over. So it's like, it's a thing, right? But she forgot something. So my dad had to get something for her. Anyway, that's a whole other story. And for those that, who do not know me, my, our, my, our child was conceived through um, IVF. So I get the whole story about fertility. Anyway, so we're here for you though, right now. So let's get back to the topic. <laughs> Sorry for the disruption. No problem. <laughs> okay. So because um, we think that we stress sleep is important. Well, how can it impact our hormones or what hormones may be impacted? Yeah, absolutely. So when we fall asleep, there's a hormone called melatonin that secretes from our brain that helps us kind of fall asleep and stay asleep through the night. 
Um, if we're not kind of listening to those body cues and going to bed when we're tired, melatonin can start to get disrupted. Um, and so melatonin actually plays a really important role in fertility in that it also concentrates in the fluid that is around the developing egg. It's one of the antioxidants that actually protects it. Um, so if you're not getting, you know, good quality sleep or for those patients that, you know, have jobs where they have to work shift work, for example, they can really have, you know, deficiencies in melatonin, um, which is something that you can supplement if you're, you know, in one of those situations. But there's, there's actually quite a few studies showing melatonin is really important for egg quality. Yes. And so typically, whether people have sleep issues or not, I find that a lot of women are taking it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Have you ever seen anybody with um, adverse ref um, impacts through taking it, like, or even um, the opposite of what it's supposed to do, which can be help sleep? Yeah, so there are definitely... If you take too much melatonin, um, generally you'll wake up feeling quite groggy in the morning. And if, so if that's the case, I'll just recommend patients to kind of back off the dosing. Standard sleep dosing is three milligrams, but you know I have some patients that take as little as one milligram. Other patients are up at 12 milligrams yeah. <laughs> to get the sleep effect. So the dosing does vary quite a lot for patients. Um, other patients I have heard um, sometimes will get like nightmares or very vivid dreams um, from melatonin. So that's the other thing that, you know, you sometimes can see with it. And again, they're generally, if you back off dosing, that usually goes away. Right, exactly. So, you know, the moral of the story is here is you might want to have guidance around it. So see someone like Dr. Peacock, right? Some naturopathic doctors. And um, so then let's go back Let's talk, talk about the relevance of actual sleeping for fertility. Yeah, absolutely. So the other piece is, so there are actually quite a few other hormones that get impacted with your sleep cycle. Um, so, you know, another really important one is one called cortisol. Um, so cortisol, most people know as their kind of stress hormone. Um, if you're not getting enough sleep, oftentimes your cortisol will start to dysregulate. So it can start rising too early in the morning. Um, so when someone's in, a, you know, kind of a more chronic stress, we'll often find that three to 5 a.m. waking period where, you know, someone will wake up and feel like wired, you know, ready mm -hmm. to kind of go start the day. Um, if kind of your cortisol starts to kind of become high and dysregulate, um, that'll pull your progesterone. So when you kind of look at kind of the cascade of your hormones, you have pregnenolone, pregnenolone converts to progesterone, progesterone converts to cortisol. So if somebody's in kind of a high stress situation, they're not sleeping well, they start creating more cortisol, this will actually pull from their progesterone. Um, and in terms of how that impacts your fertility, we know progesterone is that really important hormone during the second half of our cycle. Um, that's what, you know, basically allows an embryo to implant and, and starts to maintain the pregnancy at the beginning of a pregnancy. And so if your progesterone is low, it can actually lead to either, you know, an embryo not implanting or to early miscarriage. Um, so that's a pretty big deal, obviously, when it comes to our fertility patients. Absolutely. So we want to be careful, though, and not completely make the equation of lack of sleep equals low progesterone. No, right? So we don't want to jump the gun, because of no. course, I can just see how some people watching this will say, Oh, my gosh, that means that my progesterone is going to be messed up, right? Yeah, So it's not necessarily the case. But no. certainly, it doesn't hurt to help the sleep to help the progesterone. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then so and how about anything else? We talked, we covered melatonin, we covered, covered progesterone, anything else? Uh, well, and then, I mean, if that kind of continues long-term, we can then start to see the other half of that pathway, your testosterone, estrogen, DHT also start to become impacted as well. So it yeah. can actually mess up basically your entire hormone cascade. Yeah. And I mean, like it, it doesn't take rocket science. I mean, if you've been sleep deprived for a long time, you know, you don't feel good, right? Like it's going to impact everything. Absolutely. <laughs> Not just reproduction. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, I guess the most important thing then, 
knowing that it's important. So how about some strategies that you would recommend for people? For yeah, so, I mean, for me, I just find, first of all, like prioritizing sleep is a big thing. Because often when we get busy and things are stressful, it's, you know, um, well, I generally find first thing that'll go is exercise, right? As soon as someone's busy, they drop their exercise. The next thing is they stay up late to try and, you know, finish work or get whatever has to happen done and they shorten their sleep amount of time to do that. And so, you know, one of the first things I talk to patients about is just listen to your body. Like when you see, you know, when you start to see those cues that you're actually feeling tired, go to bed, like the other stuff can wait, right? It's, this is your long-term health and your, you know, your general lifestyle that we're looking at. And if you constantly kind of miss those cues and stay up and push past it, then you're not ever going to get into a pattern where you're getting good sleep quality. That's, that's right. And, and of course, then you get overtired and then your cortisol gets raised and then you're up again some more, right? Absolutely. Yeah, very true. And, um, I, I love it that you say this because I think this happens to a lot of us a lot of the time. And again, if it's a one night thing, that's fine. But if it is chronic, a most like that, night thing, yeah, a most night thing versus a one night thing, yeah. <laughs> right now, we're probably doing a bit of this right now, <laughs> getting prepared for the show, doing all these things. Well, absolutely, but, right? right. So, so it's not about. Uh, having perfect sleep all the time, but aiming for it. Yeah. And any other kinds of tips for people? Yeah. So also when you're kind of having a norm, like a regular bedtime routine, right? So, you know, trying to stay off of devices before bed, we know that kind of the light that gets emitted from our phones and, you know, our tablets, our screens, that, that can have a negative impact on how much melatonin you start to produce. Um, so, you know, having really encouraging patients, you know, don't have your phone in your room, like go to bed, you, you know, if you want to have a light on to read or something like that, that's fine. Um, but really trying to limit the electronic use before bedtime. So um, making sure your room is completely dark, um, you know, that darkness also helps encourage better melatonin production. So, you know, avoiding having things, you know, night lights or, you know, other light sources in your room, making sure you have blackout curtains or blinds on the windows. Um, and those are, you know, pretty simple things, but they actually do make a really big difference. Totally. And then if you're a person that likes to pee a lot, just don't drink right before you go to sleep, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to, you know, if you're somebody that's getting up two or three times at night to go to the bathroom, yeah, limiting your water fluid intake after generally kind of around 8 p.m. can help for sure. Yeah, and I, I love that you say all this. And I actually covered this in my book, Pathways to Pregnancy. Um, yeah. um, I, I call it Sleep Your Way to Fertility. And so we talk about that. And of course, I'm going to plug in my own thing, which is uh, when people do acupuncture, they certainly get a nice relaxation response and helps induce sleep. Not necessarily like right in that moment. Yes, in that moment too. But people will generally report that um, they are more, uh, that this calmness and sense of well-being will uh, go through the night and days to come, really, so that they produce yeah. that nice relaxation response at the pro appropriate time. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, things like you know, if you are someone that you know tends to be a little bit more anxious or you know worrier you know, doing things that are more calming before bed. So, you know, some patients will do really well with just some simple breathing exercises, meditation, certainly acupuncture, but they can't do that themselves at home. Um, <laughs> Don't try it at home. Points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> acupressure points can sometimes be helpful for some of those patients as well in between treatments. So um, anything that's basically going to calm the nervous system to help encourage sleep can be really helpful. How about um, herbal teas? Yeah, absolutely. So um, generally with teas, um, you know, chamomile is a pretty nice, um, like it's not really sedating, like it's kind of your more light tea. Um, if you are a little bit more anxious, like passion flower can be a really nice tea um, in the evening time before bed. Uh, valerian can be another one. Now it doesn't have the best flavor. <laughs> Valerian as a tea. It's, I don't uh, mind it. Yeah, some people are okay with it. Some aren't. So that's one that, you know, it 
could also be used in a capsule format if you don't particularly like the taste of that tea. With valerian, I find it's one that is really helpful for more of the sleep latency. Um, so if you're someone that, you know, you can fall asleep, but then you wake up two hours later and you have a really hard time getting back to sleep, often valerian will be quite helpful in those cases. Okay, I, you know what? I love that you're saying this and I need to address something because last week I had an interview with Dr. Barat, he's a fertility doctor in Toronto and as well this um, dietitian who also focuses, has a special interest in fertility. And we were, the topic actually was, you know, what are you doing during early pregnancy, right? In, in terms of nutrition. And she did mention like herbal teas and she says, be wary and cautious and of course, you know, I guess maybe she's overly cautious in terms of like when people don't know, let's just stay away. So how would you address that uh, in terms of herbal teas during early pregnancy? And of course, anybody who's been trying for a while or who've had losses like miscarriage or multiple losses, there's going to be some trepidation about anything oh, uh, and everything, right? Yeah. But, and of course, when you're anxious and you're early pregnancy about, oh my gosh, am I going to miscarry? they're not sleeping well. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do into like, you know, are, are we going to drink herbal teas in early pregnancy? So some of the teas for sure, you know, have long history of use in pregnancy without, you know, any complications, concerns. I mean, the hard thing with any botanicals and I mean, most pharmaceuticals will fall in this as well as we don't obviously do testing on women who are pregnant. <laughs> because that's not yeah. ethical, right? So with any of our botanicals, typically what we'll do is look at historic use. If these are things that have been used culturally, you know, for a long periods of time and we haven't seen any concerns, um, you know, things like chamomile, there is no, you know, there's been no teratogenic effects. Like basically we'll look at kind of animal data to see. And so, yes, some herbs you absolutely need to be careful of during pregnancy and especially in, you know, first trimester. Um, but between like passion flower, chamomile, those ones are, are quite safe um, in that period of time. There's also uh, like lavender is another like essential oil that is, you know, quite calming and yes. with another option that patients right. could use. Melatonin, absolutely, you can keep using because that's something your body would be secreting and making anyway. Yeah. Um, with something like valerian, that would usually be one I would um, usually stay away from in early pregnancy. Um, so meaning, sorry, I'm going to cut in here, meaning including the time of um, the two week wait? Generally in that two, like, I mean, again, there's not really anything, but once you have a positive test, that would be generally one I would stop. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. This is fabulous information. And I hope you guys get this. And again, just not to be so paranoid about everything that you take in. Right. And um, I find that North American society, we're pretty much an all or nothing extremist society. Right. So if you had it once by accident, really not a big deal. It's just, again, dosing matters. Right. So if you're having lots all the time, then of course, we're not going to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Any other enlightening um, thoughts, advice that you want to provide as the last comment? I mean, I would just say keep sleep as, as a big priority, right? Because it is, I guess, it is something that people often overlook, right? When it's like, okay, well, they're worried about, okay, what am I eating? Am I taking my supplements? I'm getting my doctor's office. You know, you're doing all these other things. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes the simple things like getting enough sleep, making sure you're getting enough water in, you know, yeah, absolutely. Like it's sometimes the very basic things that are free, you know, they don't cost you anything. It's, and they have so much positive benefit and impact, not just on fertility, but on, you know, when you have better sleep, you feel better. Right? You have more patience, you're going to be more productive at work. You're, it just makes everything else easier, right? So yeah. keeping it in that top of the priority list is, uh, is pretty essential. And I, I can't agree with you more. And uh, the other thing, though, is if someone is a chronic poor sleeper, one of the, my advice is 
not to stress about yeah absolutely that yeah. as well and then having strategies also during the day to help mitigate right yeah so absolutely. you know having times like i would say like having little points of the day maybe even hourly where you take like a two minute breathing break and and just help to balance out your body and help decrease the stress hormones as well so that hopefully it'll produce a better sleep over time yeah and again the amount of sleep people need does vary a lot right there are some patients that on six hours they feel great they feel rested they're good so if you're that person that's okay you know there's nothing yeah. wrong with that and then there's other patients that you know need nine ten hours yeah to feel that same way and so you know, again, it's just listening to your body and checking in to see how you're doing and if what you're doing is making sense for you. That's really great advice. So thank you for being here. And, you know, really, we'll sign off pretty soon because we want everybody to get a good night's sleep tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but before we do sign off, I do want to put a plug in for the Canadian Fertility Show, which is this Saturday. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And actually, two years ago, we did a post live post number 79 on the Canadian Fertility Show, and it was the first year. So for those of you who want more information um, above and beyond what we're talking here, just go back to that post, okay? Number 79, and you can find that on my YouTube channel now, which is Mary Wong Acupuncturist. Uh, just click on videos and you scroll down to, or, or go into the search and just put live post number 79, okay? So let's hear about the yes, so we're, we're going into the third year, which has been pretty exciting to see, like we've had some, some great growth from year one to year three. Um, this year we do have uh, three lecture rooms running throughout the day. So there's about 24 lectures. Um, we have about 60 exhibitors and basically our kind of goal is to try and cover as many different services and areas that would touch on people throughout their fertility journey. So. Um, you know, things like obviously acupuncturists, naturopaths, um, different IVF clinics, um, companies that deal with sperm and egg donation, surrogacy, um, other things like there's a couple of lawyers that are present. So if you need, you know, that side of things, that's covered off as well. Um, there's this year a yoga um, studio as well. So basically, you know, we try our best to get everything in one place so that you know, patients or, you know, potential clients have the opportunity to really see, you know, how all these things can integrate together and maybe find something that they hadn't thought about before um, that might be of interest to them and might be a help or a support on their journey. Well, and, and I think you have uh, adoption yes, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, it's really brilliant. I, I thank you for creating this. And I'll tell you, the first year I'm like oh boy who's going to show up because people are, that undergo fertility treatment or people that are experiencing fertility challenges they're so private it's like who's going to show up and I was floored and like so thrilled and so proud of everybody who showed up because it's like you're taking charge of your own fertility and you're getting to learn and wow you can do it all in one place versus just sitting there on your computer until like two in the morning and not getting sleep <laughs> well right? I think one of the I mean one of the big driving factors behind starting the show was to try to start to break down the stigma around you know people not talking about fertility and not feeling comfortable about it and people you know who have never experienced you know a concern with fertility kind of understanding that wow this actually impacts a lot of people and a lot of people that they likely know right so totally yeah people run yeah. into people right yeah it's amazing well, I, I did the talk for the first two years and um, the first year I did it, I was so thrilled. I, I did a talk called You're Not Your Diagnosis and it was very heartfelt. And after my talk, and I think it was the last talk of the day, I, I just invited everyone to actually look at each other because everybody's just so geared up on learning that they don't even look at their environment. So I actually invited everyone to look at each other. And what happened was so beautiful. Afterwards, I actually had uh, these women and couples just actually naturally gravitated towards each other and started to talk. And that to me was That's really profound. So powerful. Yeah. yeah, it was very powerful. So, you know, if you guys can go in there and also know that everyone else is in the same boat and look at each other and not just look at the vendors that are there, that would be so amazing, right? Create your own 
um, your own support, ooh, yeah. your support, right? Um, and this year, oh, before I forget, very important, I'm going to be doing a marathon fertility talks. So every hour from 10 o'clock to four o'clock on the hour, we're going to do some interviews with uh, the people that uh, the professional health professionals that are there. So it's going to be awesome. It's going to be kick butt. So you can either go directly to the booth and you can even ask your questions directly. Or, you know, if you're more shy, you can literally go on your cell phone or just watch after, right? So uh, the um, Facebook page that you'll be, uh, just like it first, because then it'll just show up on your feed. So it's a live holistic health, okay? And um, if you have any suggestions for future talks, please do so. I'd love your contribution because really this, this, these fertility talks are for you. So if there's something that's missing or that you really will need to know about, email me mw at aliveholistichealth.ca. And um, just, you can go through and um, yeah, whatever you need will be there. And of course we can contact you how for people that are interested in your services. Yeah. So um, if you're interested in the show, it's the Canadian fertility show.ca. Um, and then with um, enhanced fertility, it's again, enhanced fertility.ca. So okay, great. Um, Facebook group, Facebook pages for both and Instagram. So at, enhanced is, fertility or at Canadian fertility show. Is it uh, how much does it cost to get in? Uh, the tickets are $25, but you have a promo code for half price tickets. Um, yeah, so you can, if you want to post that for anybody that's watching, um, it's awesome. cfs.alive or dash alive. Um, okay. So you just put that in the promo code section and it's half price. Awesome. Okay, guys, you have no excuse now. You can just yeah. go. <laughs> I'll, although I will say this, if you're in the place of I am just topped up, I'm like so topped up about fertility don't go. <laughs> right? Like, let's just, let's, I don't yeah. want you to feel tortured. Right. No. But for those that are keen, and it's like, I want to get more information, and it's all in one spot. Oh, my gosh, it'll be really enriching your lives. And you can get to, you know, talk to people directly. Yeah. You know how, how much of a pain in the butt it is sometimes to try to track people down and wait for emails. Here you have people on the spot. Well, it, and it's nice, right? Because you have everybody there on the spot. Yeah. So you've got doctors, nurses, acupuncturists, naturopaths. Like, so you really can get a lot accomplished in a day. Totally. Yeah. Thank you so much again. And uh, thank you all for watching. And so we'll see you on Saturday. And I'll see you on Saturday as well, Dr. Absolutely. Peacock. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so all right. much for having me today, Dr. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for your insightful advice. I think it's awesome and it will go a long way. And um, if you, again, if you have any questions, you can contact either one of us now that you know who we are. And perhaps you can even just directly come up to us at the Canadian Fertility Show. And I don't know if I actually said it, I do have a booth at a lot yeah. of holistic health yeah. clinic. Yeah. So we'll be there. And so have a great night and we'll chat real soon. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I gotta just now stop. Oh, I think I stopped. I think it says you're still live on Facebook. Really? Well, just keep smiling because I can't turn you off. <laughs> no, it looks like it's, that's so weird. I might be cutting you off. I'm going to close. Oh, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to see something here.